Okay, so results. This is where you present things like your data, your tables, and your figures. And I want to spend a few minutes talking about some key rules about making figures. Because there's a lot of things that sort of what I would think of basic things that people don't understand why they're doing things, and that creates uh, problems in there. But there's a really cool paper that I found in this plus computational science, was, which was these 10 simple rules for better figures. So it's kind of a hybrid between what they were doing and, and what I thought was important. So rule one is identify your message. And this should be familiar from earlier when we talked about really having that key message, that key figure. So identify what is the message of your figure. And does your figure make your most important or your most interesting message obvious, right? And I want to share with you some of the, what was work in progress of one of my former students. He's gone on to get a postdoc already, so he's, he's been successful in this, so I'm not just harshing on him. Uh, but so I want to use some examples from an early iteration of one of his, uh, of one of his papers. So this was a figure he did. Um, which, I mean, I guess it looks fine until you find out what he was actually trying to show here. And his main points were that fishers generally agree that these are the reasons that people poach and that spear fishers and line fishers tend to agree. And the whole thing, the whole thing that you have to know to understand all of this is this bit here, that four is neutral and this is, means disagree, and this means agree, which you'd never, right? Would you ever know that looking at this? Like, so in his brain, that was very, very clear because he put that on the axis there and everyone should get that. But that actually doesn't sing out this message there that, that there's there. So, um, so here was the way we redid the analysis with the line for neutral there strongly agree there and strongly disagree there. And so now what you see here is there's all these things that are in the positive and only a few that are in the negative. So that to me is way more clear about what, the, what that, those two messages are, are trying to communicate. And there's probably better ways we could have done it, but you know, that, that, that was one way that we came up with, uh, which was to show positive versus negative there. So from the same paper, uh, he, he brought me this, uh, this slide here, and uh, I'm sure it's, it's okay until you realize what the main messages of this slide were. He said the two things that he was trying to communicate here is that there are poaching hotspots. Okay, let me just explain what this is. He was going back. He was going into these, uh, these reefs, and he was looking for discarded fishing gear. So this is fishing gear that's tangled on the reef. Right? And typically it's got hooks and stuff on it, so it hasn't floated in. It's pretty much evidence of poaching if you're in a marine reserve. But he wanted to compare how much discarded fishing gear there was in marine reserves that are not supposed to be fished with areas that are open to fishing. Right? So his messages here were that there are poaching hot spots. There are places where poaching is way above average, and there's no difference between marine reserves in places that are openly fished. I would never have known that looking at this. This is not screaming these two messages out. So what did we do? Again, you could probably do a better job than this, but still, we know what we've done here is this is the average for no-take reserves, and this is the average for fish sites, and those are basically the same. And we've also said there's poaching hotspots. We, we did it by saying that there's poaching hotspots. These are the places that are above, that have above average poaching. So we made the two messages here, the things that you see. You see the red versus that, and then you see that this line is about the same as that line there. So it really makes the two messages from this figure much clearer. And again, we could probably could have hired a graphic design person to do much better, but at least in this example, the two messages are, are there. The second part of identifying your message, I would say, is, you know, is it possible to develop what we would call an iconic figure? Is there a way where you can communicate it in a way that really grabs people and captures their imagination? And, you know, of course, the classic 
iconic figure is the hockey stick, right? This is how global climate has changed over the last thousand years. Um, and uh, you get this sort of spike there. This is what they call the hockey stick figure. Um, I really like this figure from, uh, from a paper by Fikret Burks back in 2006, which shows the expanding range of sea urchin fisheries globally. And you can really see, like, I always remembered this. I always remembered this sort of like contour map and really seeing this expansion there. Um, I, I threw in one of my own figures here because a lot of people have talked to me about this figure, that this figure was, you know, the one where we looked at fish biomass and then population density and found that's a pretty cruddy relationship. We looked at habitat rugosity, it's a little bit better. But then when we looked at socioeconomic development, it really fit this pattern, you know, with this sort of U-shaped pattern there. It was really, really strong. And this actually, this figure, by putting it next to the way that they thought about the world before and showing them that, that it's actually a lot different than that, that this is a much better pattern, this changed the way a lot of ecologists have thought about human environment interactions on reefs. And so that's why I put that up there, is because people have talked about that a lot. Okay, so rule number two, use color effectively. Let me ask you this, why do you guys use color in your figures? There's two things you try to do with color. There's two reasons that you use color. You create contrasts, right? And you create groups, right? What you're trying to do with color is say these two things are different or these things are similar, right? So contrast draws attention and analogy, right? So that's really what you're, that's, those are the two things that you're trying to do with color. You're trying to either group things or contrast things. People don't realize that, and that's why they often use color very poorly, because they don't know why they're doing it. They're not sure that, oh, what I'm actually trying to do is show that this is different from this, so let me use colors that show how different they are. There's a whole bunch of color theory on how you can make things look more different, right? There are only three things that you can vary in color. You can alter the hue, the value, which is the sort of lightness and darkness, and the chroma, which makes it more vivid or more muted. Those are the three bits that you can alter in color. And uh, I want to just give an example from that, uh, that publication I talked about before, um, which was three different ways of basically showing the same pattern, two of which are pretty bad and one of which is really good. And the issue is that when you get into this higher frequency shift between them, all the detail gets hidden here. It's really actually hard to see. Whereas here, because they've used color more effectively to show this contrast, which is what they wanted to do, you can actually really see the details here, whereas here it just it's a complete blur there. Right? So, so this is an example of what they wanted to do was use color to contrast, and they showed how you could do that more effectively. So um, rule three, do not misread the leader. And what I just want to, uh, uh, do not mislead the reader. Um, what I want to get at here is the, 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 the red ones are slightly misleading, in, this, in that this is the relative difference. If you only show the top, and you often see this in newspapers or something, they don't actually show you the full range of the bar graphs. They only show you the top, and they say, oh my god, this one's so much more. But when you see the whole range there, you're actually like, there's no difference between those, <laughs> right? But by showing only the partial range, you're actually misleading about this. And the other one that's here is that this is the same portion as this but using the area instead of the radius. So this makes it look a lot smaller because they're not using area. It really magnifies that difference. And you, you could make a qualifier that, you know, it is, the, you know, whatever, one quarter of the size of this or whatever it is. That's true, but it's the radius. And people think, people visually look at this as the area. They're not looking at it as the radius. And so that misleads the reader to think that the differences are bigger than they are. And so, you know, one of the rules is, is not to mislead uh, the reader. So the fourth rule, which is a really important one, is to avoid what they call chart junk, but what I heard uh, a couple years ago described as a horrenda graph, and I love that better. Um, and the, the one, 
one way of thinking about it that I, I like, I learned years ago that I really like, is that you want to keep the ink to information ratio as low as possible. Can you convey the same information with less ink on the page? And if you can, do it. Minimize the ink to information, I'm sorry, maximize the ink to information ratio. Minimize the ink on the page to say the same thing. And you know, this is one example that they gave of a horrendograph, which is just terrible. You can't see it at all. Here's how they suggested doing the same thing. Each line is there and all the other lines are behind it, but in a faded color there. So you can see how that series does relative to everything else. This is much easier to interpret. This doesn't mean anything to anyone, right? That's just that's just a horrendous graph. Um, one of my uh, uh, one of these uh, uh, sessions I did did what I would consider a total horrendous graph. This is terrible, um, and for a number of different reasons. These are meant to mean that there's more of something. What the number of days of a, a stay there? The worst part is this is here. This is here, right? So it's flipped upside down so that you have to know that this is 1 to 14 and that is above 365. You, your brain can't actually do that very well. So this is just the perfect example of what not to do in a figure, right? Because this is like a, a sort of ordinal categories, you would want those to be whatever, increasing in depth or color or texture or something that's making the ones that are higher seem higher and have it go in the correct order there. Um, this is one of my rules rather than one of theirs. Um, follow basic conventions, right? There are conventions on what should be on a figure. These include things like having your axes labeled. What's on the Y axis? What is on the X axis, right? Uh, have a key. Right? Uh, use oh, only label the major ticks. Don't label every single one. Only label the big ones so that there's less in, le less ink there. Um, if it's appropriate, use and label error bars. Right? So there's a whole range of these. You know, you should have your x-axis labeled. What is it? That's the x-axis where the origins. Having major ticks. This is the key. These are the different symbols. Right, all of those should be in there. And likewise, when you're doing a bar graph, same sort of thing. Label your axes. Tell what they are. What is, here's the treatment labels. This cell says what that x-axis label is, these are different ones. But you've got your error bar, and you say whether it's the standard deviation, standard error of the mean, or 95% confidence interval. All of those bits should be in there. Uh, captions are critical. Um, Use them effectively, and it's important to know that figures should be standalone, right? So when you have a figure, what happens, keep this in mind, people might cut out that figure and put that in a presentation or in whatever, and you want all of the information to be there, right? So don't have things like acronyms in there, right? So. And way, the ways that I tend to do my figure legends is I start with a general sentence about what the figure represents, and then I get into the specifics of it. You explain what the error bars are. Are they standard error of the mean, 95% confidence interval, standard deviation? Any abbreviations or acronyms must be explained in the figure legend, even if you've used them a thousand times in the text, because Someone might be cutting that out, and they'll never know what it means if they've cut it out, right? Um, so here's a trick that maybe you didn't know. In some journals, your figure legends can be several hundred words long. They can be very strict on space, so you might not have a lot of words, but you might actually get three or four hundred words for your figure legend. So you can be a little bit creative in how you do your figure legends. This is a paper I did in 2012, and I basically 
didn't have room for a section of the paper that I really wanted to put in there. So I made a figure that, this is a paragraph that I actually had in the paper before, and I've just basically added some photographs and referenced it. And I didn't get any pushback on there. It was completely fine. They liked it. It was visually attractive. And so you can be a little bit creative and, and actually add some sort of background material and, and stuff like that. And again, you know, that was in PNAF, so I got away with it. Okay, so I'm only going over six of the ten rules. The other ones are on that um, uh, on that uh, uh, that paper that I talked about before. Okay, so for your results, sometimes it's helpful to organize your results in a way that matches your research question or your research questions. Um, right, so you might have it set up so that there's question one, question two, question three that go along like that. It's really important not to present data that have not been described in the methods or that are not relevant to your research questions. Right, so don't put stuff in there that is just you just think it's interesting now but you didn't do the methods for it or it's not part of your research question remember earlier this was the loose bits I was talking about don't have loose bits in there your results should not include any citations say so if it's if you're citing it you're in the wrong section grab that sentence that you're in and move it somewhere else because you're it if you're citing it it's in the wrong section um, and, you know, to aid in meta-analyses, you should present your summary data and your errors, right? So this might include whatever biomass values and standard errors or, uh, you know, whatever it may be. And most journals have a supplementary material now. So you can present those, those uh, sort of summary data and that's what sort of allows people to uptake your, uh, your data better. And ultimately that's what we want, right? We want people to use our research. So. And the main thing that I would talk about doing in your results section is answering your research question, right? If at the end of your results section, you're not sure whether you've answered your research question, you've got a problem, right? You either need to change your study or you need to change your research question. The latter is probably easier, right? But if you've got a research question and you haven't answered it yet, then you've got a problem. And the answer may be no. You don't have to answer yes. The answer may be that you couldn't find the answer to it or you couldn't do it, but you, know, you should be at least, at least tackling that research question.